Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Michael Green from CSIS, and um, <coughs> it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Ambassador uh, Ken Sasai, um, who will give us um, a bit of a preview um, of the forthcoming visit uh, of uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, of Japan next week, uh, which will be uh, a truly historic visit um, in many senses, um, uh, signature uh, agreements on defense guidelines, um, uh, the real prospect of uh, progress on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, the first address by a Japanese Prime Minister ever of both sessions, uh, both houses of Congress, um, a very important uh, uh, moment and pillar for Prime Minister Abe's foreign policy strategy and for President Obama's um, pivot to Asia. Um, of course, Ambassador Sasai can't tell us everything that will happen, um, but um, hopefully he'll give us a, a bit of a hint and more importantly, set the context so that we understand what to look for and what's on the mind of Prime Minister Abe and the Japanese government at this uh, important juncture. Um, Ken Sasai is friends to many people in this room. Um, he uh, is a veteran diplomat in the foreign ministry. He's had all the key jobs, uh, Deputy Director General of uh, Asian Affairs, um, Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on Foreign Affairs, um, the uh, Economic Affairs Bureau, the Asian Affairs Bureau, um, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, the top uh, position for diplomat in Japan, and now, of course, uh, since 2012, uh, Japan's ambassador to the United States. So we'll hear from uh, Ambassador Sasai, and then I'll join him for a brief roundtable, and we'll turn it over to you for questions. And please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador Ken Sasai. Uh, thank you, uh, my good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm very happy uh, uh, to be uh, back at uh, CSIS. I think it is an occupational hazard of diplomacy that sometimes we diplomats are either so precise in our language or so general in our language. So we don't always uh, communicate clearly. That's the uh, diplomat's problem. But when I was uh, thinking about, I wanted to uh, say to you uh, about the uh, Prime Minister's upcoming visits. Uh, I asked my staff what they thought that visit uh, would uh, demonstrate. Here is what I got back. Uh, I would quote exactly uh, for your interest. The two leaders will show the directions of horizontal and vertical enhancement of bilateral partnership to contribute to the peace and prosperity of the region and the world. Horizontal and vertical uh, enhancement? I wonder why diagonal enhancement was left out. <laughs> so it's a pretty uh, general prescription I got. Uh, but if this trip is as successful as I think it will be, uh, we will uh, definitely see a diagonal enhancement, whatever that is. So, but let me start on a more basic level. I have high hopes uh, for the Prime Minister's visits, obviously as an ambassador. As you know, it comes at a historic time in our relationship. Uh, we have been building up the relationship for many years, but this year marks uh, 70 years of Japan-US relationship. Uh, we have gone from reconciliations and to collaboration. And Japan and the United States have achieved a miraculous uh, reconciliation over coming a past filled with the pains of war. Recently, uh, I spoke to a group of U.S. Marines who had fought at the Iwo Jima. They are old men now, their hair is gray, and their eyes are weak but I'm sure the memories of long ago are fresh in their mind. And yet, they invited me uh, to speak to them, uh, which tells you much about uh, reconciliation. I told them that if you look around the world, you see deep animosities between nations and people, 
and religions that have endured for centuries. You see ingrained distrust of different kinds everywhere. Yet, Japan and the United States overcame intense hostility to emerge as the most important and reliable allies. First, our government became friends and allies, and then our business began to uh, reach a gap, and then our people. Over the last 70 years, the United States and Japan have gone from fighting hand to hand to working shoulder to shoulder. Our two countries formed alliance that rests upon the foundations of such shared values as liberty, democracy, rule of law, human rights, market economy, as well as more practical strategic interests. We have developed and shared all these together. And I think it is these values and shared interests that finally brought us together and reconciled the events of our history. And that is what the Prime Minister is coming to celebrate about our friendship and alliance. The use of the word alliance to describe our bilateral relationship is not widely accepted by the Japanese public, is now widely accepted by the Japanese public. This was not necessarily the case in the past. I st still remember when I was a young foreign uh, you know, ministry official, and there was a debate about the meaning of the alliance. It was uh, still the Cold War. Uh, we thought we are part of the West, but there was still debate at the time. Are we part of the West? And there was this alliance. There was even the debate about the meaning of the alliance. Is it economic, political, or military? But those days are gone. We have come a long way to believe the values and essential strategic interests for both nations about this alliance. Now, Japan enormously appreciates America's general assistance for post-war reconstruction and values its leadership in international affairs. And I believe the United States appreciate Japan's post-war development as a peace-loving country and dependable partner. This strong relationship is evident in all areas of our national lives. Security, economy, culture, people-to-people -people exchanges. The Japan-US alliance has become the driving force for peace and stability in the Asia Pacific, as well as the poor economic prosperity and global cooperation, the rebalancing policy of the United States will further promote the cause. And I sometimes think of Mike Mansfield, who was such a wonderful ambassador and a friend of Japan. There are many good ambassadors but Ambassador Mike Mansfield has left with very warm and friendly word. Just consider how many American and Japanese ambassadors over the years have quoted his saying that the U.S.-Japan relationship is the most important relationship by none. I have sometimes wondered why this phrase banan has such appeal and resonance. It could be because it is short, or because it is not a phrase you hear a lot. But I hope the reason it has such resonance is because it is so true. If Ambassador Mansfield could see how the Japan-U.S. relationship has progressed in recent years, I think he would feel so good about his belief in it. And to mark these 70 years, of cooperation. Prime Minister Abe will arrive April 26 and be in the United States for a week. This is the first official uh, visit by Japanese Prime Minister in nine years. There was no official visit uh, for the past nine years. 
and it follows uh, President Obama's of visit as a state guest to Japan in April of last year. To symbolize the important milestone of our alliance, Prime Minister Abe will address the joint session of the Congress on April 29th, as Mike has just introduced. This will be the first time, the first time, you couldn't believe it, a Japanese Prime Minister will address the joint meeting of the Congress. And uh, you know, um, in all days, after the, immediately after the war, there were several Japanese prime ministers, you know, uh, went to the Congress and delivered a speech. Well, it was either in you know, either house, or the, uh, they did it in a separate way. So, for the first time in history, a Japanese prime minister would deliver a speech before the joint meeting of the Congress. To you, this might be uh, every year's event. But to us, this marks a rare event. That symbolizes some of the things now we are building together uh, in Asia and beyond the Asia Pacific uh, scene. I hope we get some uh, press coverage, maybe not quite as much as Prime Minister Netanyahu got. You know, obviously, uh, he had his own uh, agenda to, uh, to get attention. But we would like Americans to hear what the uh, Prime Minister Abe has to say. The speech before Congress and the state dinner, together with a substantive meeting with President Obama, will be the highlights of Washington leg of, of history. But he would also visit Boston, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Since we are on the eve of uh, Prime Minister's arrival, let me uh, give you a brief overview of how we currently read these things, and some of the subject areas the Prime Minister and the President will discuss. I can't completely predict what they would discuss, because they have their own agenda, and they have their own you know, thinking. And, but uh, uh, all these things I could say is based upon what i have talking to Tokyo so far, so I hope I will be right. But as you know, the um, <clears throat> Um, values and norms uh, that uh, enabled uh, post-war stability and post-prosperity are now uh, be challenging. And there are several challenges, obviously. So the, during the Prime Minister's visit, the leader will be discussing a number of these challenges. As you might imagine, they'll be discussing in the new defense guideline. And the guidelines of 1970 in 1997 will be revised uh, to reflect the current security environment evolving in Asia Pacific and beyond it. I, I mean, think of how this security and a technological world has uh, changed since then. Back then, no smartphone, no text, no consumer DPS. So the security environment, even in technological terms, has been uh, you know, seeing a tremendous changes these days. But also, no revolutions accelerated by social media at the time, no real globalized threats or so-called gray zone threats that doesn't constitute um, the attack. We'll also be discussing such threats and issues like uh, space and uh, cybersecurity, obviously. Uh, I don't know what kind of uh, uh, cyber security we are facing. They, these are all a little familiar if you, look, if you look at the recent trend. As you know, the contributions of self-defense forces working together with United States forces has dramatically increased in recent years. The Prime Minister and the President will take a look at the progress of bilateral security cooperation and make sure that we will be in, working together more in the future. And we have come a long way, and here I would mention, uh, you know, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, and that was the participation of Maritime Self-Defense Force in Maritime Interdiction Operation in India Ocean, Reconstruction Assistance in Iraqi, Anti-Piracy Operations, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief, as well as Operation Tomodachi in Tohoku 
tsunami and earthquake. Now, another thing in the talks will be in Japan's security, new security legislation, which reflects uh, what we call a proactive contribution to peace. Related to this is our July 1st cabinet decision on seamless security. That includes the exercise of collective defense. Everyone in a file, I hear the English term, she change, which means a transformation. I like the visual aspect of the term. Uh, for Japan, this change in our thinking on collective defense is a sea change. Uh, what kind? It is coming after 70 years of trust, and the legislation will establish a framework for Japan to further collaborate with the United States. So our joint security is on the schedule, and you probably expect that all these uh, new guidelines will be uh, produced soon and announced soon. And, um, and on top of all this security agenda, uh, the leaders would address, obviously, the economic agenda. Uh, and a major part of that uh, could be uh, how we would jointly work uh, together on TPP, which is obviously a big uh, agenda. As you know, TPP uh, will provide the 21st century order for the prosperity of Asia Pacific. With the force of the number one and number three economic powers behind it, TPP is an attempt to introduce open and transparent rules uh, to the region, uh, which will solidify the prosperity of the area and serve as a growth engine for the world. It is also, of course, important in terms of furthering the credibility of the United States rebalancing policy. As I understand it, U.S. rebalancing policy is not purely limited political and military. It also includes economic component as a very integral part of that rebalancing. We need strong and prosperous America showing its presence economically, and this is very much strategic uh, in nature. So with vigorous negotiation, we hope for a conclusion soon. The negotiations is undertaken now, even this week. I hope that the, we could uh, uh, rush up and conclude the negotiation as quickly as possible. As with most bilateral discussion between friends, and the upcoming leaders' talks will cover global corporations, of course. Our partnership extends beyond the Asia-Pacific to Europe, um, including how we would address the uh, Ukraine issue together, and uh, Middle East, Africa, uh, that would include addressing such global challenges as EBRA, counterterrorism, nuclear non-proliferation, or prevention, that would include those of North Korean threat and Iranian nuclear deals. So, uh, and also, they might, or they would, discuss women in power, climate change and environment, space, internet, as well as open and transparent rulemaking. And this covers a lot. But um, <clears throat> not, lastly, but the most important part of this uh, alliance friendship is the uh, expansions of uh, grassroots exchanges. Uh, trusted, uh, trust supported uh, through personal connections we call Kizuna uh, will continue uh, to be the foundations of a strengthened alliance. Uh, we should also broaden the base of uh, people uh, who enjoy these connections. Those who serve as a part of JET program, teaching uh, English to Japanese uh, uh, school students, or those who served in armed service uh, in Japan, or, the, or those young scholars who traveled to Japan as Kakehashi fellows, are uh, all great assets, a treasure uh, to, to closer ties between our two nations. I was uh, talking uh, a group of young people involved in the Kakehashi program not long ago. I told them the story of Senator Inoue, who served with the old Nisei 442nd Regimental Combat Team in World War II. 
in the battle, a bullet once hit him right above his heart, but uh, luckily it was stopped by the two silver dollars he had in his pocket. The point I made to them was the senator in a way's life was an unequal example of breaching Japanese and American cultures. And that while he had his own dramatic story, um, each of them would also have their own story too. And all the individual stories will continue to father uh, friendship and understanding between our nations. I was also up on the hill recently, uh, meeting with US-Japan caucus. Ever since the caucus was launched last year, more Japanese Diet members are visiting the United States and more members of Congress are visiting Japan. So uh, this is a great thing for us to see more people coming and going, and I myself uh, going to Hill more often in recent months, and I, my staff also go to the Hill more often than meeting me. And I, 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 I need to have some office in the Hill, possibly, uh, to stay there. I mean, but uh, because our lives are so uh, intertwined, we need to know more about them, and they need to know more about us. So all this is healthy, and the more Japanese who know Americans, and the more Americans who know Japanese, the better off we will be. But let me uh, start bringing this to conclude, uh, conclusion with a thought about the recent uh, Cherry Blossom Festival. Uh, at least for Washington, the uh, festival truly is the uh, public uh, face uh, for US-Japan relations. I don't know if you got to any of the events, but every year I am more and more amazed at the range of activities that are offered and how the festival is growing. A million people come and there is no end to the activities. There were all kinds of exhibits around the town and all kinds of concerts, all kinds of lectures, a film festival, baseball game. I threw a fast pitch ball in the preseason game, and a street festival with Japanese foods and entertainment. It went on and on. We even had a Japanese tango violinist. I was amazed. I mean, how could a Japanese violinist could play a tango? But it's not just a palette with the princesses on a float anymore. It is the productions of many years of a friendship building up. And what occurred to me is that the festival is a reflective of how our relationship itself has grown over the years. Every year it gets richer and deeper and broader. And I believe that is what uh, Prime Minister Abe's upcoming visit will demonstrate. So just let me thank you for caring enough about it to be here today. And uh, let me thank CSIS for inviting me to talk about it. Thank you all very much. Ambassador, thank you. Um, I'll ask one or two or maybe three questions and I'll turn it over to all of you. Um, listening to your speech and um, your recollection that in the 1980s, um, many Japanese, probably most Japanese, did not like the word alliance. Uh, reminded me of what it was like studying Japan on this side uh, in the 1980s. I studied under George Packer. Good to see you, George. <laughs> and uh, when I was at SAIS in those days, public opinion polls showed that more Americans were afraid of Japan's economy than of the Soviet Union's nuclear uh, warheads. And um, when Americans were asked uh, what countries can be trusted on trade, Japan always came at the bottom of the list. <laughs> now when you look at opinion polls, um, in Japan there's the most uh, robust support for the alliance ever. Um, and Americans uh, rank Japan the most trustworthy country in the world other than Canada, Britain, and sometimes Germany in polls. And when asked about what countries the US should do a free trade agreement with, Japan's always at the top. Uh, so it's quite a remarkable uh, transformation. A lot of people deserve credit, yourself of course, people like uh, Carla Hills and Stanley and Rusty and others in this room. But um, if it were easy, they would have sent someone else as ambassador. It's not always easy. They needed someone capable. So I want to ask you about some of the uh, tougher mm -hmm. or, or, or more difficult um, uh, aspects of this trip that have to be managed. Let me start with TPP. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, on the one hand, uh, for the president and prime minister to ignore TPP is impossible. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, formal completion of an agreement is also impossible because mm -hmm. there's the so-called legal scrub and, and things have to happen. So somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. we'll find out where we are on TPP uh, next week. Can you give us some uh, idea of the scenarios we should expect or where things appear to be uh, in discussions on the uh, agreement? Well, thank you. Uh, I think negotiations are coming to, uh, to final stage uh, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, bilateral uh, discussions. Uh, and as you know, the uh, Ambassador Mike Froman uh, was in Tokyo and having uh, and, uh, discussions, negotiation with uh, Minister Amari, and also his uh, negotiating teams of both countries are working hard day and night. Uh, as of today, uh, I think the, I would say this, uh, a major progress has been achieved. And the uh, gap uh, we had so far have considerably narrowed down. We are heading for the final process. And uh, there are some, some remaining things uh, we need to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to do. And, uh, but having said it, uh, I think uh, we have uh, come a long way. We are at the final stage of uh, ending the chapter and try to do it. And uh, I hope that the uh, President and the Prime Minister could and should welcome all this progress being made and uh, would make uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, joint uh, you know, appearance that, uh, so that they could say that uh, they are supportive of uh, all this uh, uh, progress and move forward to, uh, to get the whole uh, you know, agreement uh, together, not only with the United States, Japan, but also the other country participating uh, to come to the conclusion as early as possible. I think that's the main, main message I think both leaders could do. And um, obviously, there are uh, the issues like order and agriculture, and uh, these two are uh, sensitive to both countries. I think both parties recognize all the sensitivity. But uh, what, as I said it, I think uh, the, all the gaps are substantively narrowed down. I think we are in the now final pitch. Thanks. A lot of the press commentary about mm -hmm. this visit has spun it as um, uh, being all about China, mm. that the, the joint session of Congress, the high, the high level uh, attention being paid by the administration, mm. <clears throat> the prime minister's um, completion of uh, uh, defense guidelines and so forth, they're all about the rise of China. As you pointed out, um, it's really about common values, mm. um, uh, shared interests in an open uh, Asia Pacific but it's also about China. Yeah. So um, help us understand, if you could, um, that context. What is the thinking in Tokyo right now as mm -hmm. the prime minister gets ready to head here? Um, no doubt there's a structural mm -hmm. tension in Japan-China relations. Mm -hmm. You had, on the one hand, uh, a, a summit between the prime minister and President Xi Jinping in November, <coughs> uh, resumption of military-to-military -military mm -hmm. talks, but you also have um, uh, some evidence that uh, Chinese maritime forces are increasing their activities and front page uh, photographs of new land reclamation and military facilities. Mm. Um, what's, the, what's the mood, what's the tone on China coming into this uh, trip to the United States this, mm. this, uh, this week and next week? Uh, if you look at the, uh, the uh, relationship between Japan and China, over, uh, I would say, a couple of years, I think, uh, especially uh, two, more than two or three years ago, uh, there was a uh, rise in tensions, uh, especially evolving around the Senkaku issues. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the uh, problem is still there, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we should be confronted uh, forever. I think, the, and the Prime Minister's visit to Beijing uh, and uh, and there his meeting with uh, President Xi on the margin of, uh, of the APEC meeting uh, was a good starting point uh, for us to think what should be the best way to proceed uh, to, uh, to improve the relationship. Uh, 
and and if you look at the what's happening recently, all this uh, you know uh, easing of the tensions, I would say, uh, is obvious. And if you look at the exchange of the uh, uh, dialogue and the flow of the people, uh, not only the Chinese people coming to Japanese department floor, but all the uh, you know business and political. Uh, people are going back horse, and they are engaged more dialogue, and and, and I hope that uh, this would develop uh, to ease the tensions and uh, improve the political atmosphere in which they could work together uh, to address jointly uh, the issues of their mutual concern in the region and beyond. But having said it, uh, as you you know know that. Uh, uh, some of the actions uh, uh, exhibited or taken by Chinese uh, military, whether it is uh, uh, you know East China Sea or South China Sea, uh, there are still tensions, obviously. And so I hope that there should be more moderations on the part of uh, uh, Chinese government, uh, so that uh, this wouldn't be a major stumbling block to improve the relationship. And I I'm not that pessimistic. In the in the short run, uh, and about longer run, I think uh, we have to address uh, the issues of a longer term strategic objective of Chinese, uh, you know, military build up, and also all this uh, seemingly creep, creeping expansion in the region. So I think uh, that one uh, need to be discussed, and uh, not as uh, confronted uh, enemy, but as uh, close uh, partners. And, and for that. Uh, I think starting point is a discussion the, between the military to military. I think that is taking place, as it is taking place between Washington and Beijing, and also Tokyo to Beijing these days. So I think these hopefully would uh, would invite more of the confidence building among the service people, so that there wouldn't be any mistake about the intention of the others. All this, if all this would move smoothly, I think that will be a part of the. Uh, uh, confidence building, which would uh, improve the uh, atmosphere that we need to move on. And, and finally, before I turn to the audience, um, uh, from my own experience uh, working on the uh, National Security Council staff, um, I would personally not expect the 70th anniversary mm -hmm. of the end of the war and everything that that involves to be a major agenda item in the bilateral summit. Mm -hmm. These things, most people think these kinds of things are, but in, but, but it is going to be uh, even if it's not a major agenda in the summit, which I think will focus on the issues you've discussed, uh, it is going to be a big topic for the media. It already, mm -hmm. in the lead up to the trip, is getting a lot of attention. <clears throat> um, there's anticipation about what the prime minister will say and the government will say on the official anniversary in August, um, and this is one um, mm -hmm. stepping stone towards that big historic date. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the American public's view of Japan has actually improved over the last few years, despite um, a lot of media coverage of this issue. And in Southeast Asia, uh, polls about Japan are well over 90% positive. <laughs> um, from a kind of real politic perspective, I think the issue that probably is most important for the US government um, is the relationship with the Republic of Korea. Mm -hmm. Because um, that um, bilateral relationship with Japan and then making the most of the trilateral relationship among our three democracies uh, it has to be a key agenda item for President Obama or any future president looking at the Asia Pacific region. So um, uh, I don't know how much the Prime Minister will talk about Korea. This is a U.S.-Japan summit, but can you give us some some uh, uh, context on that front as well? What's the thinking? What are you hearing um, about um, about that set of issues? I think our relationship with uh, ROK matters a lot. ROK is a very very important uh, neighbor to us. Uh, throughout the history. And uh, our OK is a uh, uh, friend and ally of the United States. And we are also friends of ally to the United States. And uh, there is always up and down in our history, including uh, uh, some of the uh, tragic period. But, uh, you know, uh, since the, uh, we uh, normalize, uh, restore the relationship with our OK, I think if you look at all this, uh, what, uh, 50 years, uh, this year marks uh, 50 years, you know, anniversary uh, since we uh, uh, restored the diplomatic relations back in 1965. 
I think there is uh, quite a broad uh, exchanges taking place. Uh, while I was uh, director of Korean desk, uh, 1997-8, and uh, there was uh, uh, good reconciliations, and uh, there was a good uh, statement of uh, both government that, uh, and although we, we need to look at the history squarely, uh, let's uh, reconcile, move ahead. Uh, but uh, somehow after that, uh, we, uh, we are still, you know, uh, uh, the, um, <clears throat> um, facing with the, all this, uh, you know, uh, history agenda. And I don't get in much, too much in detail, but uh, <coughs> let me say this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the prime minister uh, has already made this clear. I mean, that uh, he, uh, his cabinet, uh, the cabinet, uh, upholds uh, the, uh, uh, the, all these uh, positions uh, on the recognition of history outlined by the previous governments, which include, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, Murayama and the corner statement. I think that's a very strong and simple, but very strong statement of his positions on this is now people are debating which part and that part, but he's saying that he is uh, upholding all this position in its entirety. That's a very clear thing to say. And uh, so uh, I don't have any worry about it, and I think the uh, Prime Minister would, uh, would respond to all this issue properly. I remember now you were the director of Korean Affairs mm -hmm. in 1998 when mm -hmm. the President Kim Dae-jung came mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with Prime Minister Obuchi mm -hmm. signed a, 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 a quite historic joint mm -hmm. statement mm -hmm. <clears throat> where the um, Prime Minister expressed heartfelt remorse and apology and mm -hmm. President Kim Dae-jung mm -hmm. welcomed a larger role for Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, many of us thought that was the beginning of a new uh, mm -hmm. advance. And in fact, it was, but in some ways, it seems like we need to rewind and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and get mm -hmm. some of those positive dynamics back in the relationship. But I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let me open it up. and. Uh, Briefly identify yourselves and, um, and then uh, ask a question, not a speech. Um, John. Yeah, uh, John Hemmings, um, adjunct fellow here at, at CSIS. I just wondered to what extent uh, do you think uh, the Japan, Australia, US trilateral will be something that Abe, that will continue after Abe that has real institutional uh, staying power within the, the, the Japanese uh, foreign policy community. Mm. So true. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think the, uh, our partnership uh, with Australia uh, and is very important, uh, not only in terms of uh, our economic uh, relationship with Australia, uh, but more so in the uh, changing uh, security environment in the region. And there has been uh, bi uh, the trilateral uh, discussion, dialogue going on uh, between the United States, and Japan, uh, and Australia, uh, uh, both on political and expert level, including foreign uh, policy and defense policy. And, uh, and, uh, and also th that is uh, in parallel with the effort underway on the part of the U.S. government to redistribute uh, U.S. <coughs> forces uh, stationed in Asia Pacific, and that includes the uh, uh, decrease, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, number of Marine uh, stationed in Okinawa, Tuguam, and other places. So I think uh, the uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, mm, uh, the uh, security uh, collaboration now uh, developing among the three will continue to play an important role in, in trying to secure uh, the uh, uh, regional stability and peace. Russell? Thank you, Mr. Master. I, sh I share your optimism about the visit, but <coughs> in keeping with Mike's uh, policy of raising tough, tough issues that might come up, um, let me talk about a little bit of Okinawa. Mm. Um, the, gov the Prime Minister met with the Governor Onaga a few days ago, and according to press reports, the Governor took a very hard line, citing mm. Okinawa's history of being imposed upon. 
and recent public opinion polls both in okinawa and in mainland japan show strong opposition so in a democratic country like japan how do you overcome this kind of grassroots opposition that stands in the way of a very important national security issue between the u s and japan thank you this Okinawa questions uh, evolving around uh, uh, redistributions of American forces in the region, uh, which include uh, the decrease of number of Marine Station in Okinawa, uh, so that the, uh, some of the land uh, will be returned to Okinawa and they could uh, have a better use of land and so forth to reduce the burden. But at the same time, I think important part of the, this exercise is to maintain a credible deterrence of American forces. And that's how uh, we are working and try to uh, convince and to get the understanding support from uh, uh, not only governor of Okinawa, but the people in Okinawa. And of course, it, it is not easy, but uh, we have laid this down, taking what uh, more than uh, 14 or 15 years now and there was up and down, as you know. Uh, but uh, I think uh, they, we need to stay on the course. And uh, even on some of the issues on which you are not get, getting a, a full majority of the support, I think at the time we would, we would move on. You continue to convince the people uh, there are uh, more understanding. Uh, even on, on this uh, self, self collective defense, as you said, it, the opinion, uh, if you look at the opinion poll, not necessarily the uh, uh, majority is still uh, giving green light. Uh, there are those people who are still wandering. And so I think that will require enormous effort on the part of government and to communicate sufficiently and what we are trying to do, why this, and how this will contribute to, uh, to the safety and security of the country. And that would require some of the process, and the process is, is important. This Okinawa part is also the process, and this is not easy, but I think we continue to be on the course, stay the course, and uh, to be engaged uh, with uh, talking with the governor and the people in Okinawa. And to be clear, unlike, for example, defense guidelines, which will mm -hmm. um, in the coming months be uh, mm -hmm. uh, put to the diet in the form of legislation or TPP, which will eventually mm -hmm. uh, uh, presumably be mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, signed and then put to legislation, mm -hmm. there's nothing in the Okinawa agenda mm -hmm. or the Futenma replacement facility mm -hmm. agenda that requires a decision at this juncture. It's mostly a question of politics. Is right. that right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yes, at this time, and uh, this uh, the relocation issue is uh, long, long standing issues, as you know. And uh, the current governor is taking different po uh, positions from the previous uh, government. Uh, so, uh, uh, from time to time, and there is a politics there and different positions taken by the uh, uh, leaders of local government and even uh, by central government sometimes. So, uh, there are always up and downs, but uh, as a diplomat, uh, as a person who has uh, looked uh, at all these uh, evolutions of a security relationship with the United States. And this is a must. We need to deliver this one. This would serve the purpose of not only Japanese and American uh, security interests in the region, but also eventually this would also serve the purpose of Okinawa development. Um, let's see, yes sir. Frontier, question from Taiwan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. Two questions. Um, when the Prime Minister discusses um, uh, the defense guidelines with the President, will he uh, uh, be discussing uh, Taiwan or the Taiwan Strait? Second question When the Prime Minister addresses the joint session of Congress, uh, how will he uh, address some of the touchy uh, historical issues, something that uh, Korea and China might be listening to uh, as attentively as the uh, people on Capitol Hill? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, on this guideline, uh, would the uh, Prime Minister discuss the uh, uh, Taiwan in this context? Uh, 
I'm not quite sure about it. Uh, we know that Taiwan is a very important uh, uh, regional power and a force, and uh, uh, we uh, we have a very uh, close and uh, uh, basically economic uh, partnership with Taiwan, and uh, we have uh, developed uh, over the years uh, good relationship with Taiwan. But uh, when uh, leader would discuss on this uh, guideline, it's not really uh, the pinpointing a specific country or region, uh, to be honest, at this juncture. And I think it's more generic uh, kind of discussion taking place. And I would presume uh, that uh, they would basically uh, uh, welcome all this uh, you know, uh, work uh, we have been developing together uh, over the year about this revised guidelines and uh, uh, continue to give a blessing and support uh, to this exercise. And, uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, it's necessary for us to get into a specific operational issues how all this new guideline will be applied. And I, I, we don't have to do it at this moment. And about this, uh, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister's uh, address before the joint meeting of the Congress, uh, would that uh, cover uh, sensitive uh, uh, relationship with uh, our and even China? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, you know, uh, I haven't seen all these uh, you know, uh, uh, speech writers uh, draft at this moment. I think he's working hard. And it's, uh, I think uh, up until last moment, I think Prime Minister is uh, uh, screaming doing that. But uh, I would say this, uh, this uh, speech is basically uh, the, uh, evolving around Japan-US relationship. How we have come long way, 70 years, and how we build up our relationship. As I said, we fought a war, and we reconcile and develop the partnership. And now we are friends and ally. What are the challenges? Where are we are heading for? So I would imagine that um, you know, uh, even uh, prime minister uh, talk with the president, and they would talk about the vision and uh, where uh, we are heading for. What would be the uh, world we like to pursue, uh, especially Asia Pacific? That has to be the uh, area for peace. What would be the best thing for the leaders uh, need to recognize and, and try to build together? I think that's the uh, uh, main agenda. Of course, I think uh, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, uh, that uh, we don't think the relationship with China and ROK are not important. It is, and they are uh, critically important uh, uh, partners to us. So uh, uh, without uh, prejudice to what uh, Prime Minister would say, that uh, uh, basically uh, the, his speech in the Congress is not necessarily the place to address the questions uh, evolving around the other country. It's more of our own partnership. If he comes to the United States, he needs to talk about the uh, United States and us, not necessarily uh, focusing on the other country, to be honest. But it doesn't mean that uh, we don't care about this. These are the very important countries. Uh, he goes to allocate and uh, China, he would address properly and sufficiently in our partnership. Stanley? Stanley Roth Boeing. One of the more difficult issues for U.S. Asia policy recently, maybe even a bit of a debacle, has been the Chinese proposal for the Asia Investment Infrastructure Bank, mm -hmm. and where we have seen many U.S. allies in Europe and elsewhere decide to join the bank, and Japan has stayed with the United States. But now there's a question with 50 plus members already in the bank, what to do? Do you think this might be a discussion of some type of face saving mechanism or formula, whereas Japan and the US might find a way to join the bank at some point in the future? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I don't think it means it. <laughs> uh, the Deputy Prime Minister also was in town, I think, uh, uh, what, uh, last week. And I had asked uh, ask more or less a similar question uh, to him. He was in G20 and others. But uh, in spite of all this uh, interest uh, among the public and including press on the issues, this issue was not necessarily the major agenda for G20. But we know your interest and other interests. So let me 
say this. Uh, I think the, uh, basically uh, all this uh, uh, Chinese uh, government uh, proposal uh, to create uh, new infrastructure, uh, you know, supporting banks. Um, you know, if you look at the, uh, the demand for infrastructure building uh, in, in Asia, uh, I think uh, it is obvious that there will be more demand uh, as we believe the future of economic growth, uh, you know, in the region, uh, there should be more infrastructure building, obviously. And there has been already discussion taking place long before Chinese uh, proposal about this uh, importance of infrastructure building. For example, within ASEAN, there is a <coughs> lot of talks about ASEAN connectivities, how you would do this, and how you would support bilaterally, whether from World Bank, Asia Development Bank, or bilaterally. So I think uh, there is a natural for a country like China, which is uh, making a big economic progress, have a more currency reserve, a more uh, sort of uh, uh, financial capacity uh, to support, uh, try to uh, do these things. And, but I think at this point, um, you know, the reason why in Japan and, and, past, and also uh, the United States, I'm not in a position to speak on behalf of the US government, but I think Japan and the United States are on the same page on this issue. I think the basic, uh, you know, uh, the um, topics, you know, uh, is at this moment, how would this uh, bank work? Uh, this is basically the issue of governance, you know, and, uh, and would this new bank uh, function uh, in the same way as the World Bank or ADB or other in international lending institutions are working in terms of how all these uh, transparencies, liability issues, decision making mechanism. If this should be uh, taken as a Chinese government uh, doing on its own without much uh, you know, uh, uh, attentions uh, uh, to the others, then I think uh, uh, this might uh, not be necessarily a uh, free uh, welcome. But I think the uh, Europeans, uh, many of the European countries have decided to participate in this uh, talks to, uh, on the memorandum of understanding. This memorandum of understanding is basically uh, uh, try to agree on the basic framework uh, of, of the bank. And they believe that, that they could uh, participate in, in this uh, you know, uh, talks uh, to make sure that all these international uh, you know, standards, uh, the, the disciplines, uh, will be built and introduced. That's what we are waiting for, and I, I think that's what uh, our government and the U.S. government are also tell, uh, advising Chinese government. This should be the way. So I think the, the reason why at this moment we are a bit cautious is that we really don't know how this Chinese government will come back with all this advice that we are giving. And, and, and whether this bank will be good enough uh, is different from the issue of whether we'll be participating or not. I think there is often the case confusion. And I think uh, at this moment, uh, we, we think we want to see that all these banks uh, should be working properly. Then, uh, then you have to think what you would do. At this moment, since we really are not sure at this moment, we are not really making any positions. Uh, we are still cautious about uh, uh, the possibility of participation at this moment. Um, let me see, we have, do you have time for perhaps one more question? Yeah, like Kevin, please. briefly, because we're at our hour. Hi, uh, Kevin Mayer from NMB Consulting for the State Department. Mr. Ambassador, you're still a young man. If I could ask you to look 20 years from now, say 2035, if you were looking back at this visit by the Prime Minister, what do you think or what would you hope would be the thing most remembered about the Prime Minister's visit to Washington this time? The, the, the Ambassador's what? speech at CSIS, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what is the last right. part you asked? Yeah, if you're 20 years from now looking back on this visit, what do you hope would be the thing most remembered historically about the Prime Minister's oh, visit? Oh, I see. Yeah, I think there, there are three things. Uh, one is, uh, I think, uh, this 
this uh, visit marks uh, the historic moment uh, that Japan and the United States uh, solidify and uh, strengthen the alliance dramatically uh, for, for the uh, next generations, uh, for, for the generation to come in the, for the Asia Pacific. That is uh, symbolized by one, uh, this uh, new uh, security alignment, including uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, the uh, new uh, security legislation and new guidelines, which will be a milestone document for the alliance. Number two is the, uh, all this um, uh, hope, I hope that this will be the case, uh, the uh, conclusions of this uh, TPP. And I don't think that the, all the negotiation will be concluded. Uh, I'm talking about <coughs> the whole uh, you know, exercise uh, the, you know, done by the, uh, to, uh, all the participating countries, not just between U US and Japan. But uh, uh, they, these negotiations uh, would uh, continue to go on beyond the prime minister's visit. But I hope that the prime minister's visit would, uh, would signal uh, to both US Congress and the other part of the region that the United States, Japan are the major driving force to do this. And we are coming to close it and we could deliver it. And I think Prime Minister uh, would hopefully appeal to the Congress. We need to get uh, your support on this historic and strategic agenda for both for the United States and Japan and also for the entire region. I think uh, these two are very much uh, remembered uh, when I, I uh, I'm, uh, when I'm what, uh, more than eight years old or whatever, <laughs> and I hope that will be the case. Uh, excellent, Ambassador, thank you. Uh, we'll, he'll be uh, at Blair House two nights, I think, with a joint session and, mm -hmm. and, and, and galas at the Smithsonian, so the, the traffic's not going to be great, but I think everybody in this room is willing to endure that for the U.S.-Japan Alliance and wish you the best of luck. It's a very exciting visit coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.